Hello and welcome back once again to Living Room Shakespeare. Tonight we are going to be presenting Henry V. We're all very excited. Our actors are waiting in the wings. But before we begin, a couple of quick announcements from us. If you have the ability or the inclination, please consider making a donation to the Center for, Perform mm, the Center for Performing Arts in Rhinebeck, which is a uh, the theatrical home for many of our actors in better times and is starting to become our theatrical home again. So if uh, you are interested in seeing theater from them, they are doing uh, live streamed theater this month. They have two more weekends this weekend, tonight, but also, to, uh, also tomorrow and next weekend. Uh, they are doing a musical review called Hindsight and Hope. Feel free to go to their website and check that out. And in February, they are doing a show called To Someone I Love that will also be um, streamed on the internet to your home. And so please check them out for those two shows. Uh, and also just a heads up to you about us. We are going to be uh, doing this show tonight and then we won't have Saturday night shows in February. Instead from our actors, you're going to get daily sonnets. So watch this space for sonnets every day in February and we will be back with shows on Saturday in March. All right. So Henry V, if everybody is ready, we are going to begin with the Act One. Ooh, the Act One prologue. Hang on, I've got a, I've got signs for this. Act One prologue. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike Henry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. But pardon, gentles all, the flat, unraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the nasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden O the very tasks that did affright the air at Agincourt. Oh, pardon, since crooked figure may attest in little place a million, and let us cipher to this great account on your imaginary forces work. Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchs whose high upreared it and abutting fronts the perilous narrow ocean parts asunder Piece out our imperfections with your thoughts. Into a thousand parts divide one man and make imaginary puissance. Think when we talk of horses, that you see them printing their proud hooves in receiving earth. For tis your thoughts that now must deck our kings, carry them here and there, jumping o'er times, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. For the witch supply, admit me chorus to this history, who prologue like your humble patience pray, gently to hear, kindly to judge, our play. Act one, scene one. My lord? My lord, I'll tell you, that self-bill is urged, which in the eleventh year of the last king's reign was like, and had indeed against us passed, but that the scambling and unquiet time did push it out of further question. But how, my lord, shall we uh, resist it now? It must be thought on. If it pass against us, we lose the better half of our possession, for all the temporal lands which men devout by testament have given to the church, would they strip from us, being valued thus, as much as would maintain to the king's honor full 15 earls and 1,500 knights, 6,200 good esquires, 100 almhouses right well supplied, and to the coffers of the king's beside, 1,000 pounds by year, thus runs the bill. This would drink deep. To drink the cup and all. But what prevention? The king is full of grace and fair regard and a true lover of the Holy Church. The courses of his youth promised it not. The breath no sooner left his father's body, but that his wildness, mortified in him, seemed to die too. 
Yet at that very moment, consideration, like an angel, came and whipped the offending Adam out of him. Never was such a sudden scholar made. Never came reformation in a flood with such a heady concurrence. Scouring faults, nor never hydra-headed willfulness so soon did lose a seat, and all at once as in this came. We are blessed in the change. Which is a wonder how his grace should glean it. Since his addiction was to course his vein, his company is unlettered, rude, and shallow. His hours filled up with riots, banquets, sports, and never noted in him any study, any retirement, any sequestration from open haunts and popularity. The strawberry grows underneath the nettle, and wholesome berries thrive and ripen best, neighbored by fruit of baser quality. And so the prince obscured his contemplation under the veil of wildness, which no doubt grew like the summer grass, fastest by night, unseen yet crescive in his faculty. It must be so, for miracles are ceased, and therefore we must needs admit the means how things are perfected. But my good lord, how now for mitigation of this bill, urged by the commons, doth his majesty incline it or not? He seems indifferent, or rather swaying more upon our part than cherishing the exhibitors against us. For I have made an offer to his majesty as touching France to give a greater sum than ever at one time the clergy yet did to his predecessors part with all. How did this offer seem received, my lord? With good acceptance of his majesty, save that there was not enough time to hear, as I perceived his grace would fain have done. What was the impediment that broke this off? The French ambassador upon that instant craved audience. And the hour I think has come to give him hearing. Is it four o'clock? It is. Then go we in to know his embassy. I will wait upon you, and I long to hear it. Act one, scene two. Where is my gracious Lord of Canterbury? Not here in presence. Send for him, good uncle. <clears throat> Shall we call in the ambassador, my liege? Not yet, my cousin. We would be resolved before we hear him of some things of weight that task our thoughts concerning us and France. God and his angels guard your sacred throne and make you long become it. Sure, we thank you. My learned Lord, we pray you to proceed and justly and religiously unfold why the law so leak that they have in France or should or should not bar us in our claim. And God forbid, my dear and faithful Lord, that you should fashion, rest, or bow your reading. For God doth know how many now in health shall drop their blood in approbation of what your reverence shall incite us to. Therefore, take heed how you impawn our person, how you awake our sleeping sword of war. We charge you in the name of God, take heed. Whenever two such kingdoms did contend under this conjuration, speak, my Lord, for we will hear, note, and believe in heart that what you speak is in your conscience washed as pure as sin with baptism. Then hear me, gracious sovereign, and you peers, that owe yourselves, your lives, and services to this imperial throne. There is no bar to make against your highness claim to France. May I, with right and conscience, make this claim? Gracious lords, stand for your own. Unwind your bloody flag. Look back to your mighty ancestors. Go, my dread lord, to your great-grandsire's tomb, from whom you claim. Invoke his warlike spirit and your great uncles, Edward, the Black Prince, who on the French ground played a tragedy, making defeat at the full power of France. Awake your remembrance of these valiant men, and with you, pursuant arm, renew their feats. You are their heir. You sit upon their throne. The blood and courage that renowned them runs in your veins, and my thrice percent liege is in the very merry morn of his youth for exploits and mighty enterprises. Your brother kings and monarchs of the earth do all expect that you should rouse yourself as did the former lions of your blood. They know your grace hath cause and means and might. So hath your highness never king of England had nobles richer and more loyal subjects whose hearts have left their bodies here in England and lie pavilioned in the fields of France. Call in the messenger sent from the Dauphin. 
Now are we well resolved, and by God's help and, and yours, the noble sinews of our power, France being ours, will bend it to our awe, or break it all to pieces. Now are we all well prepared to know the pleasure of our fair cousin Dauphin, for we hear your greeting is from him, not from the king. May it please your majesty to give us leave freely to render what we have in charge, or shall we sparingly show you far off the Dauphin's mess meaning and our embassy? We are no tyrant, but a Christian king. Therefore, with frank and with uncurbed plainness, tell us the Dauphin's mind. Thus then, in few. Your highness, lately sending into France, did claim some certain dukedoms in the right of your great predecessor, King Edward III, in answer of which claim the prince, my master, says that you savor too much of your youth and bids you be advised there's naught in France that can be with a nimble galliard one. You cannot revel into dukedoms there. He therefore sends you meter for your spirits, this ton of treasure, and in lieu of this, desires you let the dukedoms that you claim hear no more of you. This the Dauphin speaks. What treasure, uncle? Tennis balls, my liege. We are glad the Dauphin is so pleasant with us. His present and your pains we thank you for. When we have matched our rackets to these balls, we will in France, by God's grace, play a set, shall strike his father's crown into the hazard. Tell him he hath made a match with such a wrangler that all the courts of France will be disturbed with chases. And we understand him well, how he comes o'er us with our wilder days, not measuring what use we made of them. We never value this poor seat of England, and therefore, living hence, did give ourselves to barbarous license, as tis ever common that men are merriest when they are from home. But to the Dauphin I will keep my state, be like a king and show my sail of greatness when I do rouse me in my throne of France. And I will rise there with so full a glory that I will dazzle all the eyes of France. Yea, strike the Dauphin blind to look on us and tell the pleasant prince this mock of his hath turned his balls to gunstones, and his soul shall stand sore charged with a wasteful vengeance that shall fly with them. For many a thousand widows shall this his mock, mock out of their dear husbands, mock mothers from their sons, mock castles down, and some are yet ungotten and unborn that shall have cause to curse the Dauphin's scorn. But this lies all within the will of God, to whom I do appeal and in whose name tell you the Dauphin I am coming on, to avenge me as I may and to put forth my rightful land in a well-hallowed cause. So get you hence in peace. And to the Dauphin, his jest will savor but of shallow wit when thousands weep more than did laugh at it. Convey them with safe conduct. Fare you well. This was a merry message. We hope to make the sender blush at it. Therefore, my lords, omit no happy hour that may give furtherance to our expedition. For we have now no thought in us but France, save those to God that run before our business. Therefore, let our proportions for these wars be soon collected, and all things thought upon that may with reasonable swiftness add more feathers to our wings. For, God before, will chide this Dauphin his father's door. Therefore, that every man now task his thought, that this fair action may on foot be brought. Act two, prologue. Now all the youth of England are on fire, and silken dalliance in the wardrobe lies. Now thrive the armorers. And honor's thought reigns solely in the breast of every man. The French, advised by good intelligence of this most dreadful preparation, shake in their fear and with pale policy seek to divert the English purpose. Oh, England, 
model to thy inward greatness, like little body with a mighty heart. What mightst thou do that honor would thee do were all thy children kind and natural? Act two, scene one. Come on. Well met, Corporal Nim. A good morrow, Lieutenant Bardoff. What? Are ancient Pistol and you friends yet? Ah, for my part, I care not. I say little. I dare not fight, but I will wink and hold out mine iron. I will bestow a breakfast to make you friends, and will be all three sworn brothers to France. Let it be so, good Corporal Nim. Faith, I will live so long as I may, that's the certain of it. And when I cannot live any longer, I will do as I may. That is my rest. And that is the rendezvous of it. It is certain, it. Corporal, that he is married to Nell quickly. And certainly she did you wrong, for you were troth plight to her. I cannot tell. Things must be as they may. Men may sleep, and they may have their throats about them at that time, and some say knives have edges. Well, I cannot tell. Ah, here comes Ancient Pistol and his wife. Good corporal. Patient here. How now, mine host, Pistol? Base tyke, callst thou me host? Now by this hand I swear I scorn the term, nor shall my Nell keep lodgers. No, by my troth, not long. For we cannot lodge and board a dozen of or fourteen gentlewomen that live honestly by the prick of their needles. But it will be thought we keep a body house straight. Oh. oh well, Dave, lady, if he be not drawn now, we shall see willful adultery and murder committed. Ah, good lieutenant, good corporal, offer nothing here. Pish for thee, dog. Good Corporal Nim, show thy valor and put up your sword. Will you shog off? I would have you solace. Solace, egregious dog, O viper vile, the solace in thy most mervalous face and in thy hateful lungs, yea, in thy maw, purdy, and which is worse, within thy nasty mouth, I do retort the solace in thy bowels, for I can take, and pistol's cock is up and flashing fire will follow. If you grow foul with me, Pistol, I will scour you with my rapier as I may in fair terms. If you would walk off, I would prick your guts a little in good terms as I may. And that's the humor of it. Oh, braggart vile and damned furious white, the grave doth gape, and doting death is near, therefore exhale. Hear me, hear me what I say. He that strikes the first stroke, I will run him up to the hilt, as I am a soldier. I will cut thy throat one time or other in fair terms. That is the humor of it. Oh, hound of Crete, thinkst thou my spouse to get? I have, and I will hold the quantum quickly. My host pistol, he must come to my master. And you, hostess, he is very sick and would to bed. By my troth, he'll yield the cow, the crow, a pudding one of these days. The king has killed his heart. Good husband, come home presently. Um, shall I make you two friends? We must to France together. Why the devil should we keep knives to cut one another's throats? Let floods or swell and fiends for food howl on. You'll pay me the eight shillings I won of you at betting? Base is the slave that pays. That now I will have. That's the humor of it. As manhood shall compound, push home. By this sword, he that makes the first thrust, I'll kill him. By this sword, I will. Sword is an oath, and oaths must have their course. Corporal Nim. And thou wilt be friends, be friends, and thou wilt not, why then, be enemies with me too. Put up. I 
shall have my eight shillings I one of you at betting. A noble shalt thy have, and present pay, and liquor likewise will I give to thee, and friendship shall combine, and brotherhood. I'll live by Nim, and Nim shall live by me. Is not this just? For I shall settler be, I'm to the camp, and profits will accrue. Give me thy hand. I shall have my noble. In cash, most justly paid. Well then, that's the humor of it. Bardolph, be blithe. Nim, rouse thy vaunting veins. Boy, bristle thy courage up for Falstaff. He is dead, and we must yearn, therefore. Would I were with him. Wheresomere he is, either in heaven or in hell. Nay, sure he's not in hell. A maid of finer end and went away, and it had been any Christum child, a parted even just between twelve and one even at the timing of the tide, for after I saw him fumble with the sheets and play with flowers and smile upon his fingers' ends, I knew there was but one way. How now, Sir John, quoth, I, what man, be your good cheer? So I cried out, God, 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 three or four times. Now I, to comfort him, bid him a should not think of God. I hoped that there was no need to trouble himself with any such thoughts yet. So bade me lay more clothes on his feet. I put my hand into the bed and felt him, and they were as cold as any stone. Then I fell to his knees, and they were as cold as the, any stone. And so upward and upward, and all was as cold as any stone. They say he cried out of sack. Aye, that it did. And of women. Nay, that it did not. Yes, that it did, and said they were devils incarnate. I could never abide carnation. T'was a color he never liked. They said once the devil would have him about women. I did in some sort indeed handle women. Come, let's away. My love, give me thy lips. Look to my chattels and my movables. Let census rule, trust none, for oaths are straws. Men's faiths are wafer cakes, and hold fast is the only dog, my duck. Let us to France, like horse leeches, my boys, to suck, to suck, the very blood to suck. And that's but unwholesome food, they say. Touch her soft mouth and march. Farewell, hostess. I cannot kiss, that's the humor of it, but adieu. Let housewife reappear. Keep close, I thee command. Farewell, adieu. Act two, scene four. Thus comes the English with full power upon us, and more than carefully it us concerns to answer royally in our defenses. Therefore, the Dukes of Berry and of Bretagne, of Brabant and of Orleans shall make forth, and you, Prince Dauphin, with all swift dispatch to line and new repair our towns of war with men of courage and with means defendant. For England, his approaches makes as fierce as waters to the sucking of a gulf. It fits us then to be as provident as fear may teach us out of late examples left by the fatal and neglected English upon our fields. I must redoubt it, Father. It is most we meet arm against us to the foe. For peace itself should not so dull a kingdom. The war not nor no known quarrel were in question. But that defense is, musters preparation, should be maintained, assembled, and collected, as were war in the expectation. Therefore, I say, it is meet we all go forth to view the sick and feeble parts of France, and let us do it with no show of fear. No with no more than if we heard that England were busied with a winsome Morris dance. For my good leech, he is so idly kinged, her scepter so fantastically borne by a vain, giddy, shallow, humorous youth. That fear attends her not. Oh, peace, Prince Dauphin, you are too much mistaken in this king. 
question your grace the late ambassadors with what great state he heard their embassy, how well supplied with noble counselors, how modest an exception, and withal, how terrible and constant resolution. Well, tis not so, my lord high constable, but though we think it so, it is no matter. In cases of defense, tis best to weigh the enemy more mighty than he seems. Think we King Harry strong, and princes look you strongly armed to meet him. The kindred of him hath, seen, hath been fleshed upon us, and he has bred out of that bloody strain that haunted us in our familiar paths. Witness our too much memorable shame when Cressy battle fatally was struck, and all our princes captived by the hand of that black name, Edward, Black Prince of Wales. Ambassadors from Harry, King of England, do crave admittance to your majesty. We'll give them present audience. Go and bring them. You see this chase is hotly followed, friends. Turn head and stop pursuant, for coward dogs most end their mouths when what they seem to threaten runs far before them. Go, my good sovereign, take up the English short and let them know of what moniker you are the head. Self-love, my liege, is not so vile a sin as self-neglecting. From our brother, England? From him, and thus he greets your majesty. He wills you in the name of God Almighty that you divest yourself and lay apart the borrowed glories then by, that by gift of heaven by law of nature and of nations, long to him and to his heirs, namely the crown and all wide stretched honors that pertain by custom and the ordinance of times unto the crown of France. That you may know tis no sinister nor no awkward claim picked from the wormholes of long vanished days nor from the dust of old oblivion raked. He sends you this most memorable line and every branch truly demonstrative, willing to overlook this pedigree. And when you find him evenly derived from his most famed of famous ancestors, Edward III, he bids you then resign your crown and kingdom, indirectly held from him, the native and true challenger. Or what else follows? Bloody constraint. For if you hide the crown even in your hearts, there will he rake for it. Therefore in fierce tempest is he coming and bids you in the bowels of the Lord deliver up the crown and to take mercy on the poor souls for whom this hungry war opens his vasty jaws. And on your head turning the widow's tears, the orphan's cries, the dead men's blood, the pining maiden's groans for husbands, fathers, and betrothed lovers that shall be swallowed in this controversy. This is his claim, his threatening, and my message. Unless the Dauphin be in presence here, to whom expressly I bring greeting too. For us, we will consider of this further. Tomorrow you shall bear our full intent back to our brother England. For the Dauphin, I stand here for him. What to him from England? Scorn and defiance, slight regard, contempt, and anything that may not misbecome the mighty sender doth he prize you at. Say, if my father render fair turn, it is against my will, for I desire nothing but odds with England. To that end, as matching to his youth and vanity, I did present him the Paris balls. He'll make your Paris Louvre shake for it. And be assured, you'll find a difference, as we his subjects have in wonder found between the promise of his greener days and these he masters now. Now he wastes time even to the utmost grain. That you shall read in your own losses if he stay in France. Tomorrow shall you know our mind at full. Dispatch us with all speed lest that our king come here himself to question our delay, for he is footed in this land already. You shall be soon dispatches with fair conditions. 
A night is but small breath and little pause to answer matters of this consequence. Act three, prologue. Thus, with imagined wing, our swift scene flies in motion of no less celerity than that of thought. Suppose that you have seen the well-appointed king at Hampton here embark his royalty and his brave fleet with silken streamers, the young Phoebus fanning. Play with your fancies and in them behold upon the hempen tackle ship boys climbing. Hear the shrill whistle wind which doth order give to sounds confused. Behold the threatened sails, borne with invisible and creeping wind, draw the huge bottoms through the furrowed sea. Oh, do but think you stand upon the ravage and hold the city on the inconstant billowing dancing. For so appears his fleet majestical, holding due course to Harfleur. Follow. Follow. Grapple your minds to sternage of this navy and leave your England as dead midnight still, gardened with grandsires, babies, and old women, either past or not arrived to pith and puissance. For who is he whose chin is but enriched with one appearing hair that will not follow the culled and choice drawn cavaliers to France? Work. Work your thoughts and therein see a siege. Behold the ordnance on their carriages, with all fatal mouths gaping on girded Harfleur. Suppose the ambassador from the French comes back, tells Harry that the king doth offer him Catherine, his daughter, and with her to dowry some petty and unprofitable dukedoms. The offer likes not, and the nimble gutter with line stock now the devilish cannon touches. <laughs> And down goes all before them. Still be kind and eke out our performance with your mind. Act three, scene one. Once more to the breach, dear friends, once more! Oh, close the wall up with your English dead. In peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard favored rage, then lend the eye a terrible aspect. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide, hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height. On, on, you noblest English, whose blood is fed from fathers of war, proof. Father's death, like so many Alexanders, have in these parts from morn till even fought, and sheathed their swords for lack of argument. Dishonor not your mothers. Now attest that those whom you called fathers did beget you. Be copy now to men of grosser blood and teach them how to war. And you, good yeomen, whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not. For there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, straining upon the start. The game's afoot. Follow your spirit. And upon this charge cry, God for Harry, England, and St. George! Oh. Act three, scene two. Oh my God. On, 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 to the breach, to the breach. Pray the corporal stay. The knocks are too hot, and for mine own part, I have not a case of lives. The humor of it is too hot. That is the very plain song of it. The plain song is most just, for humors do abound, knocks go and come, God's vassals drop and die, and sword and shield in bloody field doth win immortal fame. Would I were in an alehouse in London, 
I would give all my fame for a pot of ale and safety. And I, if wishes would prevail with me, my purpose should not fail with me, but thither would I hie. As duly, but not as truly, as bird doth sing and bear. Up to the breach, ye dogs! Avoid, ye cullions! Be merciful, great duke, to men of mold. Abate thy rage, abate thy manly rage. Abate thy rage, great duke. Good Bawcock, bait thy rage. Use lenity, sweet Chuck. These be good humors. Your honor wins bad humors. As young as I am, I have observed these three swashers. I am boy to them all three. But all they three, though they would serve me, could not be man to me. For indeed, three such antics do not amount to a man. For Bartle, he is white-livered and red-faced, by the means whereof, ah, uh, faces it out, but fights not. For Pistol, he hath a killing tongue and a quiet sore, by the means whereof, a uh, breaks words and keeps whole weapons. For Nim, he hath heard that men of few words are the best men, and therefore he scorns to say his prayers, lest he should be thought a coward. And yet, his few bad words are matched with his few good deeds, for I never broke any man's head but his own, and that was against a post when he was drunk. I will steal anything and call it purchase. Bardolph stole loot case for it 12 leagues and sold it for three halfpence. Nim and Bardolph are sworn brothers in flinching, and they would have me as familiar with men's pockets as their gloves or their handkerchiefs, which makes much against my manhood if I should take from another's pockets to put into mine, for it is the plain pocketing of wrongs. I must leave them and seek some better service. Their villainy goes against my weak stomach and therefore I must cast it up. Captain Flewellen, you must come presently to the mines. The Duke of Gloucester would speak to you. To the mines? Tell you the Duke. It is not so good to come to the mines, for look you, the mines is not according to the disciplines of the war. The concavities of it is not sufficient, for look you, the, the adversary you may discuss unto the duke, look you, is digit himself four yard under the counter mines. By Cheso, I think I will plow it all if there is not better direction. The Duke of Gloucester, to whom the order of the siege is given, is altogether directed by an Irishman, a very valiant gentleman in faith. Is it Captain McMorris, is it not? I think it be. Ay, Cheso, he is an ass as in the world. I will verify as much in his beard. He has no more directions in the true disciplines of the wars, look ya, of the Roman disciplines, than is a puppy dog. Uh, here it comes, and the Scots captain, Captain Jamie with him. Uh, captain Jamie is a marvelous, valorous gentleman, there is certain and of great expedition and knowledge in the ancient wars upon my particular knowledge of his directions. By Chesso, he will maintain his argument as well as any military man in the world in the disciplines of the pristine wars of the Romans. I say good day, Captain Flewellen. Good day unto your worship, good Captain James. How now, Captain McMorris? Have you quit the mines? Have the pioneers given over? By Christ, la, tis ill done. The work is give over. The trumpets sound the retreat. By my hand, I swear, in my father's soul, the work is ill done. It is give over. I would have blowed up the town, so Christ save me, la, in an hour. Oh, tis ill done. Tis ill done. By my hand, tis ill done. Captain McMorris. I beseech you now, would you vouchsafe me, look you, a few disputations with you, as partly touching or concerning the disciplines of the war, the, the Roman wars, in the way of argument, look you, and, and friendly communication, partly to satisfy my opinion, and partly for the satisfaction, look you, of my mind, as touching the direction of the military discipline, that is the point. It's all be very good, and faith, good captains both. And I shall quit you with good leave, as I may pick occasion that shall I marry. It is no time to discourse, so Christ save me. The day is hot, and the weather, and the wars, and the king and the dukes. It is no time to discourse. The town is beseeched, 
and the trumpet call us to the breach. And we talk and be crushed, do nothing, tis shame for us all. And there is throats to be cut and works to be done and there is nothing done. So Christ save me, la. By the mess air, these eyes of mine take themselves to slumber. I'll do good service or I'll look at the ground for it. I or go to death and I'll pay it as valor valorously as I may. That's all I'll surely do. That is the breath and the long. Mary, I would full fain hear some questions between you two. Captain McMorris, I think, look, you're under your corrections. There is not many of your nation. Of my nation? What is my nation? Is a villain and a bastard and a knave and a rascal. What is my nation? Who talks of my nation? Look, you. If you take the matter otherwise than is meant, Captain McMorris, per adventure, I shall think you do not use me with that affability as in discretion you ought to use me. Look, you, being as good a man as yourself, both in the disciplines of war and in the derivation of my birth and in other particularities. I do not know you so good a man as myself. So, Christ, save me. I will cut off your head. Gentlemen, both, you will mistake each other. Ah, that's a foul fault. Boop, boop, boop. The town sounds a parley. Captain McMorris, when there is more better opportunity to be required, look you, I will be so bold as to tell you I know the disciplines of war, and there is an end. Hey. Act three, scene three. How it resolves the governor of the town. This is the latest parley we will admit. Therefore, to our best mercy, give yourselves, or like to men proud of destruction, defy us to our worst. For, as I am a soldier, and name that in my thoughts becomes me best, if I begin the battery once again, I will not leave the half-achieved harfleur till in her ashes she lie buried. The gates of mercy shall be all shut up. What is it then to me if impious war arrayed in flames like to the prince of fiends? do with his smirched complexion, all fell feats and linked to waste and desolation. What is to me? Therefore, you men of Harfleur, take pity of your town and of your people. While yet my soldiers are in my command, if not, why, in a moment look to see the blind and bloody soldier with foul hand defile the locks of your shrill shrieking daughters, your fathers taken by the silver beards, and their most reverent heads dashed to the walls. Your naked infants spitted upon pikes. What say you? Will you yield and this avoid, or guilty in defense be thus destroyed? Our expectation hath this day an end. The Dauphin, whom of suckers we entreated, returns us that his powers are not yet ready to raise so great a siege. Therefore, great king, we yield our town and lives to thy soft mercy. Enter our gates, dispose of us and ours, for we no longer are defensible. Open your gates. Come, Uncle Exeter. Go you and to enter Halfleur, there remain, and fortify it strongly against the French. Use mercy to them all. For us, dear uncle, tonight in Halfleur we will be your guest. Tomorrow for the march are we addressed. Act three, scene four. Alice. Tu as été en Angleterre et tu parles bien le langage. Un peu, madame. Je te prie, monseigneur. Il faut que j'apprenne à parler. Comment appelez-vous la main en anglais? La main? Elle est appelée de hand. De hand? Et les doigts? Les doigts. Ma foi, j'oublie de les doigts. Ma jamais je vendrai les doigts. Je pense qu'ils sont appelés des fingers. Oui, des fingers. La main, des hand. Les doigts, des fingers. Je pense que je suis bien écolier. Je gagne deux mots d'anglois vitement. 
Dites-moi, l'anglais pour le bras. The arm, madame. Et le coude? The elbow. The elbow. Je m'en fais la répétition de tous les mots que vous m'avez appris à le présent. Il est trop difficile, madame, comme je pense. Excusez-moi, Alice. Écoutez. De hand, de fingre, de alma, de bilbo. De elbow, madame. Oh, Seigneur Dieu, je m'en oublie. De elbow. Comment appelez-vous le col? De neck, madame. De neck. Et le menton? De chin. De chin. Le col, de neck, le menton, de chin. Oui. Sur votre honneur et vérité, vous prononcez les mots aussi doigts que la natif d'Angleterre. Je n'en doute point d'apprendre, par la grâce de Dieu, et un peu de temps. N'avez-vous pas d'air oubli ce que je vous en ainsi? Ah non, je resterai à vos promptements. De hand, de fingre, de arm, de elbow. Sur votre honneur, de elbow. Ainsi dis-je. De elbow, de nick et de sin. Excellent, madame! C'est assez pour une fois. Allons-nous allons à dîner. Act 3, scene 5. Tis certain he hath passed the river some. And if he be not fought with all, my lord, let us not live in France. Let us quit all and give our vineyards to a barbarous people. De revanche, shall a few sprays of us, the emptying of our father's luxury, our scions put in wild and savage stock, spurt up so suddenly into the clouds and overlook their grafters. Dieu de Bate, where have they this metal? Is not their climate foggy, raw, and dull, on whom, as in despite, the sun looks pale, killing their fruit with frowns? Can sodden water decoct their cold blood to such valiant heat? And shall our quick blood, spirited with wine, seem frosty? Oh, for honor of our land, let us not hang like roping icicles upon our houses' thatch, whilst a more frosty people sweat drops of gallant youth in our rich fields. Poor we may call them in their native lords. Where is Montjoy the herald? Speed him hence. Let him greet England with our sharp defiance. Up, princes! And with spirit of honor, edged more sharper than your swords, high to the field! Bar Harry England that sweeps through our land with pennons painted in the blood of Harfleur. Go down upon him. You have power enough. And in a captive chariot into Rouen, bring him our prisoner. This becomes the great. Sorry am I, his numbers are so few, his soldiers sick and famished in their march. For I am sure when he shall see our army, he'll drop his heart into the sink of fear and for achievement offer us his ransom. Therefore, Lord Constable, haste on Montjoy, and let him say to England that we send to know what willing ransom he will give. Prince Dauphin, you shall stay with us in Rouen. Not so, I do beseech your majesty. Be patient, for you shall remain with us. Now forth, Lord Constable and princes all, and quickly bring us word of England's fall. Act three, scene six. How now, Captain Fluellen? Coming from the bridge? I assure you, there is very excellent services committed at the bridge. Is the Duke of Exeter safe? The Duke of Exeter is as magnanimous as Agamemnon, and a man that I love and honor with my soul and my heart and my duty and my life and my living and my utmost power is not, God be praised and blessed, any hurt in this world, but keeps the bridge most valiantly with excellent discipline. There is an ancient lieutenant there at the bridge. I think in my very conscience, he is as valiant a man as Mark Antony. And he is a man of no estimation in the world, but did see him do his gallant service. What do you call him? He is called Ancient's Pistol. I know him not. Oh, here is the man. Captain, I thee beseech to do me favors. The Duke of Exeter doth love thee well. Aye, I praise God, and I have merited some love at his hands. 
Bardolf, a soldier, firm and sound of heart, and of buxom valor, hath by cruel fate and giddy fortune's furious fickle wheel that goddess blind that stands upon the rolling restless stone. Aye, your patience, ancient pistol. Fortune is painted blind with a muffler for her eyes to signify to you that fortune is blind. And she is painted also with a wheel to signify to you, which is the moral of it, that she is turning and in constant and mutability and variation. And her foot, look you, is fixed upon a spherical stone which rolls and rolls and rolls. In good truth, the poet makes a most excellent description of it. Fortune is an excellent model. Fortune is Bardolph's foe and frowns upon him, for he hath stolen a pax and hanged must be, a damned death. Let gallows gape for dog, let man go free, and let not hemp his windpipe suffocate. But Exeter hath given the doom of death for packs of little price. Therefore go speak, the duke will hear thy voice, and let not Bardos' vital thread be cut with edge of penny cord and vile reproach. Speak, captain, for his life, and I will thee requite. Ancient pistol, I do partly understand your meaning. Why then rejoice, therefore? Certainly, ancient, it is not a thing to rejoice at. For if, look you, he were my brother, I would desire the Duke to use his good pleasure and put him to execution, for discipline ought to be used. Die and be damned, and figo for thy friendship. It as well. The fig of Spain. Very good. Why, this is an arrant, counterfeit rascal. I remember him now, a bawd, a cut purse. I'll assure you. I uttered as brave words at the bridge as you shall see in a summer's day. Why, tis a gull, a fool, a rogue, that now and then goes to the wars to grace himself at the return into London under the form of a soldier. And such fellows are perfect in the great commander's names, and they will learn you by rote where services were done. At such and such a sconce, at such a breach. And this they con perfectly in the phrase of war, which they trick up with new tuned oaths, and what a beard of the general's cut and a horrid suit of the camp will do among foaming bottles and ale-washed wits is wonderful to be thought on. But you must learn to know such slanders the age, or else you may be marvelously mistook. I tell you what, Captain Gower, I do perceive he is not the man that he would gladly make show to the world he is. If I find a hole in his coat, I will tell him my mind. Hark you, the king is coming, and I must speak with him from the bridge. God bless your majesty. How now, Fluellen? Camest thou from the bridge? Aye, so please your majesty. The Duke of Exeter has very gallantly maintained the bridge. The French has gone off, look you, and there is gallant and most brave passages married adversary was a possession of the bridge, but he is enforced to retire. And the Duke of Exeter is master of the bridge. I can tell your majesty, the Duke is a brave man. What men have you lost, Fluellen? The perdition of the adversary hath been very great, reasonable, great, Mary. For my part, I think the Duke has lost never a man, but one that is like to be executed for robbing a church, one Bardolph, if your majesty know the man. We would have all such offenders so cut off and we give express charge that in our marches through the country, there be nothing compelled from the villages, nothing taken but paid for, none of the French upbraided or abused in disdainful language. For when lenity and cruelty play for a kingdom, the gentler gamester is the soonest winner. You know me by my habit. Well then, I know thee. What shall I know of thee? My master's mind. Unfolded. Thus says my king, say thou to Harry of England, though we seemed dead, we did but sleep. Advantage is a better soldier than rashness. Tell him we could have rebuked him at Harfleur, but we thought not good to bruise an injury till it were full ripe. Now we speak upon our cue and our voice is imperial. England shall repent his folly, see his weakness, and admire our sufferance. Bid him therefore consider of his ransom, which must proportion the losses we have borne, the subjects we have lost, 
the disgrace we have digested, which in wait to re-answer his pettiness would bow under. For our losses, his exchequer is too poor. For the effusion of our blood, the muster of his kingdom too faint a number, and for our disgrace, his own person kneeling at our feet, but a weak and worthless satisfaction. To this add defiance and tell him for conclusion, he hath betrayed his followers whose condemnation is pronounced. So far my king and master, so much my office. What is thy name? I know thy quality. Montjoy. Thou dost thy office fairly. Turn thee back. And tell thy king I do not seek him now, but could be willing to march on to Calais without impeachment. For, to say the sooth, my people are with sickness much enfeebled, my numbers lessened, and those few I have almost no better than so many French. Go, therefore, tell thy master, here I am. My ransom is this frail and worthless trunk, my army but a weak and sickly guard. Yet, God before, tell him we will come on, though France himself and such another neighbor stand in our way. There's for our labor, Montjoy. Go, bid thy master will advise himself. If we may pass, we will. If we be hindered, we shell your tawny ground with your red blood discolor. And so, Montjoy, fare you well. The sum of all our answer is but this. We would not seek a battle as we are, nor as we are. We say we sh will not shun it. So tell your master. I shall deliver so, thanks to your highness. I hope they will not come upon us now. We are in God's hand, uncle, not in theirs. March to the bridge. It now draws toward night. Beyond the river we'll encamp ourselves, and on tomorrow, bid them march away. Act three, scene seven. Will it never be morning? Tis a midnight, I'll go arm myself. Ah, the Dauphin longs for morning. He longs to eat the English. Huh. I think he will eat all he kills. By the white hand of my lady, he's a gallant prince. Pff, swear by her foot that she may tread out the oath. Is simply the most active gentleman of France. Doing his activity, and he will still be doing. Never did harm that I heard of. <laughs> Nor will do none tomorrow. He will keep that good name still. I know him to be valiant. I was told that by one that knows him better than you. What's he? Mary, he told me so himself, and he said he cared not who knew it. He needs not. It is no hidden virtue in him. Uh, by my faith, sir, but it is. Never saw anybody, ne never anybody saw it but his lackey. Tis a hooded valor, and when it appears, it will bait. I will never said well. I will cap that proverb with there is flattery and friendship. And I will take up what at with give the devil his due. Well placed. There stands your friend for the devil. Have at the very eye of that proverb with a pox of the devil. My Lord High Constable, your English lie within 1,500 paces of your tents. Would it were day. Alas, poor Harry of England, he longs not for the dawning as we do. What a wretched and peevish fellow is this King of England. To mope with his fat brained followers so far out of his knowledge. If the English had any apprehension, they would run away. But they lack, for if their heads had any intellectual armor, they would never wear such heavy headpieces. 
Now it is time to arm. Come, shall we be about it? It is now two o'clock, but let me see. By ten, we shall eat. We shall have each a hundred Englishmen. Act four, prologue. Now, entertain conjecture of a time when creeping murmur and the pouring dark builds the wide vessel of the universe. From camp to camp through the foul womb of night, the hum of either army stilly sounds that the fixed sentinels almost receive the secret whispers of each other's watch. Fire answers fire, and through their play, flames each battle sees the other's umbered face. Steed threatens steed and high and boastful nays, piercing the night's dull ear. And from the tents, give dreadful note of preparation. The country cocks do crow, the clocks do toll, and the third hour of drowsy morning name. Proud of their numbers, the secure in soul, the confident and over lusty French do now the low rated English play at dice and chide the crippled tardy gated knight who, like a foul and ugly witch, doth limp so tediously away. The poor condemned English, by sacrifices, by their watchful fires sit patiently and inly ruminate the morning's danger and their gesture, sad, investing, lank lean, cheeks and war-worn coats presented them unto the gazing moon, so many horrid ghosts. Oh, now who will behold the royal captain of this ruined band, walking from watch to watch, from tent to tent? Let him cry, praise glory on his head, for forth he goes and visits all his host, bids them good morrow with modest smile and calls them brothers, friends and countrymen. On his royal face, there is no note how dread an army hath enrounded him, nor doth he dedicate one jot of color unto the weary and all wretched knight, but freshly looks and overbears a taint with cheerful semblance and sweet majesty that every wretch pining and pale before Beholding him, plucks comfort from his looks, and largess his liberal eye doth give to every one, thawing cold fear, that mean and gentle all. Behold, as many unworthies define, a little touch of Harry in the night. And so our scene must to the battle fly, where, oh, for pity, we shall much disgrace with four or five must vile and ragged foils. Right ill-disposed and brawl ridiculous, the name of Agincourt. Yet sit and see, minding true things by what their mockings be. Act four, scene one. Gloucester, tis true we are in great danger. The greater, therefore, should our courage be. There is some soul of goodness in things evil, would have been observingly distill it out. For our bad neighbor makes us early stirs, which is both healthful and good husbandry. Thus may we gather honey from the weed and make a moral of the devil himself. Good morrow, old Sir Thomas Erpenham. A good soft pillow for that good white head were better than a churlish turf of France. Oh, not so, my liege. This lodging likes me better, since I may say now lie I like a king. It is good for men to love their present pains upon example, so the spirit is eased. Lend me thy cloak, Sir Thomas. My brother, commend me to the princes in our camp. Do my good morrow to them, and anon, Desire them into my pavilion. I shall, my liege. Ah, shall I attend your grace? No, my good knight. Go with my uncle to my lords of England, and I in my bosom must debate a while. And then I would go no other company. Uh, 
the Lord in heaven bless thee, noble Harry. God of mercy, old heart, thou speakst cheerfully. Kivala? A friend. Discuss unto me, art thou officer, or art thou beast, common and popular? I am a gentleman of a company. Trailst thou the piss on pike? Even so. What are you? As good a gentleman as the emperor. Then you are better than a king. The king's a bawcock and the heart of gold. I kiss his dirty shoe and from heart string I love the lovely bully. What is thy name? Harry Leroy. Leroy, a Cornish name. Art thou of Cornish crew? No, I'm a Welshman. Knowest thou Fluellen? Yes. Tell him I'll knock his leak about his pate upon St. Davy's Day. Do not you wear your dagger in your cap that day, lest he knock that about yours? Art thou his friend? And his kinsman, too. The Figo for thee, then. I thank you. God be with you. My name is Pistol Called. It sorts well with your fierceness. Captain Flewellen. Oh, in the name of Jesus Christ, speak lower. If you would take the pains but to examine the wars of Pompey the Great, you shall find, I warrant you, that there is no tittle, toddle, or pibble pabble in Pubby's camp. But the, ne the enemy's loud, you hear him all night. If the enemy is an ass and a fool and a prating coxcomb, is it meet to think you that we should also look you be an ass and a fool and a prating coxcomb in your own conscience now? I will speak lower. I pray you and beseech you that you will. Though it appear a little out of fashion, there is much care and valor in this Welshman. Brother John Bates, is that not the morning which breaks yonder? I think it be, but we have no great cause to desire the approach of day. Ah, uh, we see yonder the beginning of the day, but I think we shall never see the end of it. Who goes there? A friend. Under what captain serve you? Under Sir Thomas Erpingham. Ah, uh, a good old commander and a most kind gentleman. I pray you, what thinks he of our estate? Even as men wrecked upon a sand that look to be washed off the next tide. He hath not told his thought to the king. No, nor does not need he should. For I think the king is but a man, as I am. His ceremonies laid by, in his nakedness he appears. Uh, but, and, and though his affections are higher mounted than ours, yet when they stoop, they stoop with a like wing. Therefore, when he sees reason of fears, as we do, his fears out of doubt be of the same relish as ours are. Yet, in reason, no man should possess him with any appearance of fear, lest he, by showing it, should dishearten his army. He may show what outward coward he, courage he will, but I believe, as cold a night as tis, he could wish himself in Thames up to the neck. And so I would he were, and I by him at all adventures, so we were quit here. By my troth, I will speak my conscience of the king. I think he would not wish himself anywhere but where he is. Then I would he were here alone. So should he be sure to be ransomed and many a poor men's lives saved. I dare say you love him not so ill to wish him here alone. Howsoever you speak this to feel other man's minds. Methinks I could not die anywhere so contented as in the king's company. His cause being just and his quarrel honorable. <laughs> That's more than we know. Aye, or more than we should seek after. But we know enough if we know we are the king's subjects. If his cause be wrong, our obedience to the king wipes the crime of it out of us. But if the cause be not good, the king himself hath a heavy reckoning to make when all those legs and arms and heads chopped off in battle shall join together at the latter day and cry. I am afeard there are few die well that die in a battle. Now, if these men do not die well, it will be a black matter for the king that led them to it, whom to disobey were against all proportion of subjection. But this is not so. 
The king is not bound to answer the particular endings of his soldiers. For they purpose not their death when they purpose their services. Besides, there is no king, be his cause never so spotless, if it comes to the arbitrant of swords, can try it out with all unspotted soldiers. Some poor adventure have on them the guilt of premeditated and contrived murder. Some of beguiling virgins with the broken seals of perjury. Some making the wars their bulwark that have before gored the gentle bosom of peace with pillage and robbery. Now, if these men have defeated the law and outrun native punishment, though they cannot strip men, they have no wings to fly from God. And if they die unprovided, no more is the king guilty of their damnation than he was before guilty of those impieties for which they are now visited. Every subject's duty is the king's, but every subject's soul is his own. Therefore, should every soldier in the wars do as every sick man in his bed, wash every moat out of his conscience, and dying so, death is to him advantage. Tis certain, every man that dies ill, the ill upon his own head, the king is not to answer it. But I do not desire he should answer for me, and yet I determined to fight lustily for him. I myself heard the king say he would not be ransomed. Aye, he said so, to make us fight cheerfully. But when our throats are cut, he may be ransomed, and we ne'er the wiser. If I live to see it, I will never trust his word after. <laughs> You'll never trust his word after. Come, tis a foolish saying. <laughs> Your reproof is something too round. I should be angry with you, if the time were convenient. Well, let it be a quarrel between us, if you live. I embrace it. How shall I know thee again? Give me any gauge of thine, and I will wear it. Then, if ever thou darest acknowledge it, I will make it my quarrel. Ha, here's my glove. Give me another of thine. There. This will I also wear. If ever thou come to me and say, after tomorrow, this is my glove, by this hand I will take thee a box on the ear. <laughs> If ever I live to see it, I will challenge it. <laughs> oh, thou darest as well be hanged. Well, I will do it, though I take thee in the king's company. Keep thy word, fare thee well. Be friends, you English fools, be friends. We have French quarrels, you know, if you could tell how to reckon. Upon the king, let us our lives, our souls, our depths, our careful wives, our children and our sins lay on the king. We must bear all. Oh, hard condition, twin born with greatness, subject to the breath of every fool who sense no more can feel but his own ringing. What infinite heart's ease must kings neglect that private men enjoy? And what have kings that privates have not too, save ceremony? Save general ceremony. And what art thou, thou idle ceremony? O oh, ceremony, show me but thy worth. What is thy soul of adoration? Art thou aught else but place, degree, and form, creating awe and fear in other men? Wherein thou art less happy being feared than they are in fearing? I am a king that find thee, and I know tis not the bomb, the scepter, and the ball the sword, the mace, the crown imperial, the throne he sits on, nor the tide of pomp that beats upon the high shore of this world. No, not all these, thrice gorgeous ceremony, not all these laid in bed majestical can sleep so soundly as the wretched slave who with a body filled and vacant mind gets him to rest, crammed with distressful bread. And but for ceremony, such a wretch winding up days with toil and nights with sleep at the forehand and advantage of the king, the slave, a member of the country's peace, enjoys it. But in gross brain little watts, what watch the king keeps to maintain the peace? Whose hours the peasant best advantages? Ah, my lord. Your nobles, jealous of your absence, seek through your camp to find you. Good old knight, collect them all together at my tent. I'll be before thee. I will do it, my lord.
O God of battles, steal my soldiers' hearts, possess them not with fear. Take from them now the sense of reckoning, if the opposed numbers pluck their hearts from them. Not today, O Lord, O oh, not today. Think not upon the fault my father made encompassing the crown. I, Richard's body, have interred anew, and on it have bestowed more contrite tears than from it issued forth drops of blood. Five hundred poor I have in yearly pay, who twice a day their withered hands hold up toward heaven to pardon blood. More will I do, for all I can do is nothing worth, since that my penitence comes after all, imploring pardon. My liege. My brother's Gl Gloucester's voice? Aye, I know thy errand. I will go with thee. A day, my friends, and all things stay for me. Act four, scene two. What's happening? Uh, the sun doth gild our armor up, my lords. Montea Chevelle, my horse valet. La quoi ha! Oh, shit. Oh, brave spirit. Now, my lord constable. Hark, how are steeds for present service? Nay! Count them and make incision into their hides, that their hot blood may spin in English eyes and doubt them with a superfluous courage. Ha! The English are embattled, you French peers. To horse, you gallant princes, straight to horse. Do but behold yon poor and starved band in your fair show shall suck away their souls, leaving them but the shales and husks of men. There is not work enough for all our hands, scarce blood enough in all their... They have said that it is positive against all exceptions, death. lords, that our superfluous lackeys and our peasants who in unnecessary actions swarm about our squares of battle were enough to purge this field of such a hildling foe. Though we look upon this mountain's basis by, took stand for idle speculation, but that our honors must not. What's to say? A very little, little let us do, and all is done. Then let the trumpet sound, the tucket sonnets, and the note to mount, for our approach shall so much dare the field that England shall couch down in fear and yield. They have said their prayers. They stay for death. Now we go, and send them dinners and fresh suits, and give their fasting horses provender, and after all, fight with them. I say, but for my Gideon to the field, I will the banner from the trumpet take and use it for my haste. Come, come away. The sun is high and we overwear the day. Act four, scene three. Where is the king? Of fighting men, they have full three score thousand. There's five to one. Besides, they all are fresh. 
God's arm strike with us. She's a fearful odds. God be with you, princes all, all to my charge. If we know more meat till in heaven, then joyfully my noble Westmoreland, my dear Gloucester, and my good Lord Exeter, and my kind kinsmen, warriors all, adieu. Farewell, good Canterbury, and good luck go with thee. Farewell, kind Lord. Fight valiantly today. And yet I do thee wrong to mind thee of it, for thou art framed in the firm truth of valor. He is full of valor as of kindness, princely in both. Oh, that we now had here but one ten thousand of those men in England that do no work today. What's he that wishes so? My cousin Westmoreland? No, my fair cousin. If we are marked to die, we are enough to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men the greater share of honor. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. By Jove, I am not covetous for gold, nor care I who I doth feed upon my cost. It yearns me not of men my garments wear, such outward things dwell not in my desires. But if it be a sin to covet honor, I am the most offending soul alive. No faith my cost. Wish not a man from England. God's peace, I would not lose so great an honor as one man more methinks would share for me for the best hope I have. Oh, do not wish one more. Rather, proclaim it, Westmoreland, through my host, that he which hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made and crowns for convoy put into his purse. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, tomorrow is St. Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispin's day. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot, but he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the king, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups, freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother be ne'er so vile this day shall gentlest condition and gentlemen in england now abed shall think themselves a curse they will not hear and hold their manhoods cheap whiles and he speaks that fought with us upon saint crispin's day <laughs> My sovereign lord, bestow yourself with speed. The French are bravely in their battle set and will with all expedience charge on us. All things already if our minds be so. Paris, the man whose mind is backward now. Let us not wish for more help from England, cuz. God's will, my liege. Would you and I alone without more help could fight this royal battle? Why, now thou hast unwished 5,000 men, which likes me better than to wish us one. You know your place. God be with you all. Once more I come to know of thee, King Harry, if for thy ransom thou wilt now compound before thy most assured overthrow, for certainly thou art so near the gulf thou needs must be in glutted. Who hath sent thee now? The Constable of France. I pray thee bear my former answer back. Bid them achieve me and then sell my bones. Good God! Why should they mock, fellow 
Poor, poor fellows thus. And many of our bodies shall no doubt find native graves upon the which I trust shall witness live and brass of this day's work. Let me speak proudly. Tell the constable we are but warriors for the working day. Our gayness and our guilt are all besmirched with rainy marching in the painful field. But by the mass, our hearts are in the trim. And my poor soldiers tell me, yet ere night they'll be in fresher robes, or they will pluck the gay new coats or the French soldiers' heads and turn them out of service. If they do this, as if God please, they shall. My ransom then will soon be levied. Harold, save thou thy labor. Come thou no more for ransom, gentle herald. They shall have none. I swear, but these my joints, which if they have as I will leave them, them shall yield them little. Tell the constable. I shall, King Harry, and so fare thee well. Thou never shalt hear herald any more. I fear thou once more come again for ransom. Act four, scene four. <clears throat> Yield, cur. Je pense que vous êtes gentilhomme de bonne qualité. Qualité, call me, custer me. Art thou a gentleman? What is thy name? Discuss. Oh, senor, dear. Oh, Signor Du should be a gentleman. Prepend my words, oh, Signor Du, and mark, oh, Signor Du, thou diest on point of fox. Except, oh, Signor, thou do give me, give to me egregious ransom. Oh, I ye petit moi. Moi shall not serve. I will have 40 moys. Or I will fetch thy rim out at thy throat in drops of crimson blood. It's still impossible. <clears throat> D'échapper la force de ton bois. Brass? Cur, thou damned and luxurious mountain goat offers me brass. Oh, Pardonnez-moi. Sayest thou me so? Is that a ton of moise? Come hither, boy. Ask me, this slave in French, what is his name? Et contes. Como et es pen? Monsieur Le Fur. He says his name is Master Fur. Master Fur. I'll fur him and furk him and ferret him. Discuss the same in French unto him. I do not know the French for fur and ferret and furk. Bid him prepare, for I will cut his throat. Uh, que dit il, monsieur? Oh, je vous supplie, pour l'amour de Dieu, me pardonnez. Je suis gentleman de bon bazar, portez ma vie, et je vous donnerai du ce sang écou. What are his words? He prays you to save his life. He is a gentleman of a good house, and for his ransom, he will give you 200 crowns. Tell him my fury shall abate, and the crowns I will take. Petit monsieur. Que dit-il? Il est content de vous donner la liberté. <gasps> Je vous donne un mille écrivains. Expound unto me, boy. He gives you a thousand thanks. As I suck blood, I will some mercy show. Follow me. I did never know so full a voice issue from so empty a heart. Aye, but the saying is true. The empty vessel makes the greatest sound. Bardolf and Nim had ten times the valor as this roaring devil. I the old play, that any man may pare his nails with a wooden dagger, and they are both hanged. And so would this be if he durst steal anything adventurously. I must stay with the lackeys, with the luggage of this camp. The French might have a good prey of us if he knew of it, for there is none to guard it but boys. Act four, scene five. Oh, Diable! Well, they, all is confounded, all. Reproach and everlasting shame sits mocking on our plumes. A merchant fortune, do not run away. Why, all our ranks are broke. A perdable shame. 
Let's stab ourselves, be these wretches that we played at dice for. Is this the king we sent to for his ransom? Shame and eternal shame, nothing but shame. Let us die in honor once more, black again, back again. And he that will not follow Orleans now, let him go hence with his cap in hand, like a base panda. Hold the chamber door whilst by a slave, no gentler than my dog, his fairest honor is contaminated. Disorder, that hath spoiled us. Friend us now. Let us, he let us on heaps go offer up our lives. We are now yet living in the field, smother up the English in our throngs, if any order might be thought upon. Oh, the devil take order now, all to the throng. Let life be short, else shame will be too long. Act four, scene six. Well have we done, thrice valiant countrymen, but all's not done, yet keep the French the field. The Duke of York commends him to your majesty. Lives he, good uncle? Thrice within this hour I saw him down, thrice up again in fighting, from helmet to the spur all blood he was. In which array brave soldier doth he lie? But hark, what new alarum is the same? The French have reinforced their scattered men, and then every soldier kills his prisoners. Give the word through. Act four, scene seven. Here's the boys and the luggage. Tis expressly against the law of arms. Tis as arrant a piece of knavery, mark you now, as can be offered in your conscience. Now, is it not? Tis certain there's not a boy left alive. And the cowardly rascals that ran from the battle had done the slaughter. Besides, they've burned and carried away all that was in the king's tent. Where for the king, most worthily, has caused every soldier to cut his prisoner's throat. Uh, Tis a gallant king. Aye, he was born at Monmouth, Captain Gower. What call you the town's name where Alexander the Pig was born? Alexander the Great. Why, I pray, uh, is not Pig great? The Pig, or the Great, or the Mighty, or the Huge, or the Magnanimous are all one reckonings, save the phrase is a little variations. I think Alexander the Great was born in Macedon. His father was called Philip of Macedon, as I take it. I think it is in Macedon where Alexander is born. I tell you, Captain, if you look in the maps of the world, I warrant you'll, you'll start finding the comparisons between Macedon and Monmouth, that the situations look you is both alike. There is a river in Macedon, and there is also moreover a river in Monmouth. Tis alike as my fingers is to my fingers. And there is salmon in both. <laughs> if you mark Alexander's life well, Harry of Monmouth's life is come after it indifferent well. But there is figures in all things. Alexander, God knows, and you know, in his rages and his furies, and his wraths and his callers and his moods, and also being a little intoxicate and in his pains did in his ales. And his angers, look, you kill his best friend, Cletus. Our king is not like him in that. He never killed any of his friends. Yeah, it's not well done, Mark. You now take the tales out of my mouth ere it is made and finished. I speak, but in the figures and comparisons of it. As Alexander killed his friend Cletus, being in his ales and cups, so also Harry Monmouth, being in his right wits and his good judgments, turned away the fat knight with the great belly doublet. He was full of jests and japes and knaveries and mocks. I forgot his name. Sir John Falstaff. That is he. I tell you, there is good men porn at Monmouth. Here comes his majesty. I was not angry since I came to France until this instant! Take a trumpet, Herald. Ride thou unto the horsemen on yon hill. If they will fight with us, bid them come down or void the field. They do offend our sight. If they do neither, we will come to them. Besides, we'll cut the throats of those we have. 
And not a man of them that we shall take shall taste our mercy. Go and tell them so. Here comes the herald of the French, my liege. His eyes are humbler than they used to be. How now? What means this herald? Thou no, no, knowest thou not that I have find, find these bones of mine for ransom? Comest thou again for ransom? No, great king. I come to thee for charitable license, that we may wander o'er this bloody field to look our dead and then to bury them, to sort our nobles from our common men. Oh, give us leave, great king, to view the field in safety and dispose of their dead bodies. I tell thee truly, Harold, I know not if the day be ours or no. For yet a many of your horsemen peer and gallop o'er the field. The day is yours. <sighs> Praise be God, and not our strength for it. <sighs> What is this castle called that stands hard by? They call it Agincourt. Then call we this the field of Agincourt, fought on this the day of Crispin Crispianus. Your grandfather, a famous memory, and please your majesty, and your great uncle Edward the Black, Prince of Wales, as I have read in the Chronicles fought the most brave battle here in France. They did, Flewellen. Your Majesty says very true. If your Majesty is remembered of it, the Welshman did good service in a garden where leeks did grow, wherein leeks in their Monmouth cap, which your Majesty know to this hour is an honorable badge of the service. And I do believe your Majesty takes no scorn to wear the leek upon St. Tabby's day. I wear it for a memorable honor, for I am Welsh, you know, good countrymen. All the water in we could not wash out your majesty's Welsh blood out of your body. I can tell you that, but bless it and preserve it as long as it pleases his grace and his majesty too. Thanks, good my countrymen. I just so, I am your majesty's countryman. I care not who knows it. I will confess it to all the world. <laughs> I need not to be ashamed of your majesty. Praise be God, so long as your majesty is an honest man. God keep me so. Our heralds go with him. Bring me just notice of the numbers dead on both our parts. Call yonder fellow hither. Soldier, you must come to the king. Soldier, why wearest thou that glove in thy belt? And it please your majesty, tis the gauge of one that I should fight withal if he be alive. An Englishman? An it please your majesty, a rascal that swaggered with me last night, who if alive and ever dare to challenge this glove, I have sworn to take him a box of the ear. Or if I can see my glove in his belt, which he swore as he was a soldier he would wear, if alive I shall strike it out soundly. What think you, Captain Flewellen? Is it fit this soldier keep his oath? He is a craven and a villain else, and to please your majesty in my conscience. It may be his enemy is a gentleman of great sort, quite from the answer of his degree. Though he be as good a gentleman as the devil is, as Lucifer and Beelzebub himself, it is necessary, look, your grace, that he keep his vow and his oath. If he be perjured, see you now, his reputation is as arrant a villain and a jack sauce as ever his black shoe trod about ground and his earth in my conscience. Ugh. And keep thy vow, sirrah. <laughs> When thou meetest the fellow. So I will, my liege, as I live. Who servest thou under? Under Captain Gower, my liege. Gower is a good captain, and his good knowledge and literature to the wars. Call him hither to me, soldier. I will, my liege. Here, Flewellen, wear thou this favour for me and stick it in thy belt. If any man challenge this, he is an enemy to our person. If thou encounter any such, apprehend him, and thou dost me love. Your grace do me as great honours as can be desired in the hearts of his subjects. I would fain see the man that has but two legs that shall find himself aggrieved at this glove. That is all. But I would fain see it once, and please God of his grace that I might see. Knowest thou, Gower? 
He is my dear friend and please you. Pray thee, go seek him and bring him to my tent. I will fetch him. My Lord of Canterbury and my brother Gloucester, follow Fluellen closely at the heels. The glove which I have given him for a favor may happily purchase him a box of the ear. It is the soldiers. I, by bargain, should wear it myself. Follow, good cousin Warwick. If that the soldier strike him, as I judge by his blunt bearing, he will keep his word. Some sudden mischief may arise of it, for I do know Fluellen valiant and touched with Charler, hot as gunpowder, and quickly will return an injury. Follow and see there be no harm between them. Go you with me, uncle of Exeter. Act four, scene eight. I warrant it is tonight, you captain. God's will and his pleasure, captain, I beseech you now. Come apace to the king. There is more good towards your peradventure than is in your knowledge to dream on. Sir, know you this glove? No, the glove. I know the glove is a glove. I know this, and thus I challenge it. Splut! An arrant traitor as any is in the universal world, or in France or in England. How now, sir, you villain? Do you think I'll be forsworn? And no way, Captain Gower. I will give trees and his payment into plows, I warrant you. I am no traitor. That's a lie in thy throat. I charge you in his majesty's name, apprehend him. Here is his majesty. How now? What's the matter? My leech, here is a villain and a traitor that look, you, your grace has struck the glove which your majesty has took. My leech, this was my glove. Here's the fellow of it. And he that I gave it to in change promised to wear it. I promised to strike him if he did. I have met this man with my glove and I have been as good as my word. Your majesty here now, saving your majesty's manhood. What an arrant, rascally, beggarly, lousy knave it is. <laughs> I hope your majesty is permit testimony and witness and will avouchment that this is the glove that your majesty has given me in your conscience now. Give me that glove, soldier. Look, here's a fellow of it. Twas I, indeed, thou promised to strike, and thou hast given me most bitter terms. And please, your majesty, let his neck answer for it, if there is any martial law in the world. How canst thou make me satisfaction? <laughs> All offenses, my lord, come from the heart. Never never came any from mine that might offend your majesty. It was ourself thou didst abuse. Your majesty came not like yourself. You appeared to me but as a common man. Witness the night, your garments, your lowliness, and what your highness suffered under that shape, I beseech you, take it for your own fault and not mine. For had you been as I took you for, I made no offense. Therefore, I beseech your highness, pardon me. Here, Uncle Exeter, fill this glove with crowns and give it to this fellow. Give him the crowns. And, Captain, you must needs be friends with him. By this day and this light, the fellow has metal enough in his belly. Hold, there is 12 pence for you. And I pray you to serve gut and keep you out of prolls and prabbles and quibbles and quarrels and dissensions and I warrant it is the better for you. I'll none of your money. It is with good will, I can tell you. It will serve you to mend your shoes. <laughs> Come, wherefore should you be so bashful? Your shoes is not so good. Tis a good selling, I warrant you, or I will change it. Now, Harold, are the dead numbered? Here's the number of the slaughtered French. What prisoners of good sort are taken, Uncle? <laughs> Charles, Duke of Orleans, nephew to the king. John, Duke of Bourbon, and Lord Boucherqual. Of other lords and barons, knights and squires, full 1,500 besides common men. This note doth tell me of 10,000 French that in the field lie slain, of princes in this number, and nobles bearing banners. There lie dead 126, added to these, of knights, esquires, and gallant gentlemen, 8,400, of the which 500 were but yesterday dubbed knights, 
so that in these 10,000 they have lost, there are but 1,600 mercenaries. The rest are princes, barons, lords, knights, squires, and gentlemen of blood and quality. Here was the royal fellowship of death. Where is the number of our English dead? Edward, the Duke of York, the Earl of Suffolk, Sir Richard Ketley, Davy Gam, Esquire, none else of name and of all other men but five and twenty. Oh God, thy arm was here and not to us, but to thy arm alone. Ascribe we all, when without stratagem, but in plain shock and even play of battle, was ever known so great and little loss on one part and on the other? Take it, God, for it is none but thine. Tis wonderful. Come, go we in procession to the village, and be it death proclaimed through our host, to boast of this or take the praise from God, which is his only. Is it not lawful, and please your majesty, to tell how many is killed? Yes, Captain. But with this acknowledgement that God fought for us. Yes, my conscience. He did us great good. Do we all holy rites. Let there be sung non nobis and te deum, the dead with charity enclosed in clay. And then to Calais and to England then, where ne'er from France arrived more happy men. Act five. Prologue. Ouch safe to those that have not read the story, that I may prompt them. And of such as have, I humbly pray them to admit the excuse of time, of numbers, and due course of things, which cannot in their huge and proper life be here presented. Now we bear the king toward Calais. Grant him there. They're seen, heave him away upon your winged thoughts, athwart the sea. Behold, the English beach pales in the flood with men, with wives, with boys, whose shouts and claps outvoice the deep-mouthed sea, which, like a mighty whiffler for the king, seems to prepare his way. So let him land and solemnly see him set on to London. As yet, the lamentation of the French invites the King of England to stay at home. The emperors coming in behalf of France to order peace between them. All occurrences, whatever chanced, till Harry is back returned again to France. There must we bring him. And myself have played the interim by remembering you tis past. Then brook abridgment, and your eyes advance after your thoughts straight back again to France. Act five, scene one. Nay, that's right. But why wear you your leek today? St. David's Day is past. There is occasions and causes why and wherefore in all things. I will tell you, as my friend, Captain Gower, the rascally, scald, beggarly, lousy, prag and knave, pistol, which you and yourself and all the world know to be no better than a fellow, look you now, of no merits. He's come to me and brings me bread and salt yesterday, look you, and bid me eat my leek. It was in place where I could not breed no contention with him, but I will be so bold as to wear it in my cap till I see him once again, and then I will tell him a little piece of my desires. <laughs> Why, here he comes, swelling like a turkey cock. It is no matter for his swellings nor his turkey cocks. God bless you, ancient pistol, you scurvy, lousy knave. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Art thou bedlam? Dost thou thirst, base Trojan, to have me fold up Parca's fatal web? Hence I am qualmish at the smell of leek. I beseech you heartily, scurvy, lousy knave, at my desires, in my requests, 
in my petitions to eat, look ya, this leek, because, look ya, you do not love it, nor your affections and your appetites and your digestions does not agree with it. I would desire you to eat it. Not for Codwallader and all his goats. There is one goat for you. <laughs> Will you be so good, Scald Knave, as to eat it? Base Trojan, thou shalt die. Oh, you say very true, Scald Knave, when God's will is. I will desire you to live in the meantime and eat your victuals. Come, come, there's sauce for it. You called me yesterday, Mountain Squire, but I will make you today a squire of low degree. I pray you fall to. If you can mock a leek, you can eat a leek. Enough, Captain. You've astonished him. I say I will make him eat some part of my leek, or I will paint his paint for days. Fight, I pray you. Yeah, it's good for your green wound and your bloody coxcomb. Must I bite? Yes, certainly. And out of doubt and out of question, too. And ambiguities. By this leak, I will most horribly revenge. I eat and I... Oh, I swear. Mm. Eat, I pray you. Will you have some more sauce to your leak? There is not enough leak to swear by. Why is I cudgel? Dost thou see I eat? Much good do you, scald knave heartily. Nay, pray you throw none away. The skin is good for your broken coxcomb. When you take occasion to see leaks hereafter, I pray you mock at them. That is all. Mm, good. Hey, leaks is good. Hold you. There is a groat to heal your pate. Give me a groat? Yes, verily and in truth, you shall take it, or I'll have another leak in my pocket which you shall eat. I take thy groat in earnest of revenge. If I owe you anything, I will pay you in cudgels. God be with you, and keep you, and heal your pate. All hell shall stir for this. Go, go. You're a counterfeit, cowardly knave. Will you mock at an ancient tradition begun upon an honorable respect and worn as a memorable trophy of predeceased valor and dare not avouch in your deeds any of your words? I've seen you gleeking and galling at this gentleman twice or thrice. You thought because he could not speak English in the native garb, he could not therefore handle an English cudgel. <laughs> you find it otherwise and henceforth let a Welsh connection te you, teach you a good English connection. Fare ye well. Doth fortune play the housewife with me now? News have I that my Nell is dead of the spittle of malady of France. And there my rendezvous is quite cut off. Old I do wax and from my weary limbs honor is cudgeled. Well, Bought all turn, and something lean to cut purse of quick hand. To England will I steal, and there I'll steal. And patches will I get unto these cudgeled scars, and swear I got them in the Gallia Wars. Act five, scene two. Peace to this meeting. Wherefore are we are met? Unto our brother France and to our sister. Health and fair time of day, joy and good wishes to our most fair and princely cousin, Catherine. And as a branch and member of this royalty, by whom this great assembly is contrived, we do salute you, Duke of Burgundy and Princess French and peers. Health to you all. Right joyous are we to behold your face, most worthy brother England, fairly met. So are you, Princes English, every one. My duty to you both, on equal love, great kings of France and England, that I have labored with all my wits, my pains and strong endeavors to bring your most imperial majesties unto this bar and royal interview. Your mightiness on both parts can best can witness since then, my office hath so far prevailed that face to face and royal eye to eye, you have congreated. Let it not disgrace me if I demand before this royal view 
what rub or what impediment there is. You are assembled and my speech entreats that I may know the let why gentle peace should not expel these inconveniences and bless us with her formal qualities. If, Duke of Burgundy, you would the peace, whose want gives growth to the imperfections which you have cited, you must buy that peace with full accord to all our just demands, whose tenors and particular effects you have scheduled briefly in your hands. The king hath heard them, to the which as yet there is no answer made. Well, then the peace, which you before so urged, lies in his answer. I have but with a cursory eye or a glance to the articles. Pleaseth your grace to appoint some of your counsel presently to sit with us once more with better heed to resurvey them. We will suddenly pass our accept and peremptory answer. Brother, we shall. Go Uncle Exeter and take with you free power to ratify, augment or alter as your wisdom's best shall see advantageable for our dignity. Anything in or out of our demands, yet leave our cousin Catherine here with us. She is our capital demand, comprised within the four rank of our articles. Fair Catherine, and most fair, will you vouchsafe to teach a soldier terms such as will enter a lady's ear and plead his love suit to her gentle heart? Your Majesty shall mock at me. I cannot speak your England. <laughs> oh, fair Catherine. If you will love me soundly with your French heart, I will be glad to hear you confess it brokenly with your English tongue. Do you like me, Kate? Uh, Pardonnez-moi. I cannot tell what is like me. An angel is like you, Kate. And you are like an angel. Could you? Que je suis semblable à les anges. Oui, vraiment. So votre grâce, on s'y dit-il. I said so, dear Catherine, and I must not blush to affirm it. Oh, bon Dieu. Les langues des hommes sont pleines de tromperies. What, what says she, fair one? The, the, the tongues of men are full of deceits? Oui. That the tongue of the man is be full of deceit. That is the princess. <laughs> the princess is, a, is the better English woman, in faith. Kate, my wooing is fit for thy understanding. I am glad thou canst speak no better English, for if thou couldst, thou wouldst find me such a plain king that thou wouldst think I have sold my farm to buy my crown. I know no ways to mince it in love, but directly to say, I love you. And if you urge me farther than to say, do you in faith, I wear out my suit. Give me your answer in faith, do, and so clap your hands in the bargain. Now, how say you, lady? So votre honor, may understand well. Mary, if you would put me to verses or to dance for your sake, Kate, why you undid me for the one. I am neither words nor measure and for the other. I have no strength in measure, yet a reasonable measure and strength. Nor I have no cunning in protestation, only downright oaths, which I never use till urged, nor never break for urging. If thou canst love a fellow of this temper, Kate, whose face is not worth sunburning, then that never looks in his glass for love of anything he sees there, let thine eye be, I be thy cook. If thou wouldst have such a one, take me. And take me, take a soldier, take a soldier, take a king. And what sayest thou then to my love? Speak, my fair, and fairly, I pray thee. Is it possible that I should love the enemy of France? Oh, no, it is not possible you should love the enemy of France, Kate. But in loving me, you should love the friend of France. For I love France so well that I will not part with a village of it. I will have it all mine. And Kate, when France is mine and I am yours, then yours is France and you are mine. I, I cannot tell what is that. No, Kate, uh, I, I will tell thee in French. 
Uh, J'ai quand sur les possessions de France et quand vous avez les possessions de moi. Uh, let, let me see what, what, what then. Uh, 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 Saint Denis, be my speed. Uh, donc votre et France et vous étiez uh, mien. <laughs> it is as easy for me, Kate, to conquer the kingdom as to speak so much more French. I should never move thee in the French unless it be to laugh at me. Sauf votre honneur. Le François que vous parlez, il est meilleur que l'anglois avec lequel je parle. No, Faith, it's not, Kate. But, Kate, dost thou understand thus much English? Canst thou love me? I cannot tell. Can any of your neighbors tell, Kate? I'll ask them. Come. I know thou lovest me. And at night, when you come into your closet, you'll question this gentlewoman about me. And I know, Kate, you will to her dispraise those parts of me that you love with your heart. But, good Kate, mock me mercifully, the rather gentle princess, because I love thee cruelly. How answer you? A plus belle Catherine du Mal, mal très cher et David Dies. Your Majesty, have a false French enough to deceive the most sage demoiselles of the state of France. <laughs> now, fire upon my false French, by mine honour and true English. I love thee, Kate, by which honour I dare not swear thou lovest me. Yet my blood begins to flatter me that thou dost, notwithstanding the poor and untempering effect of my visage. Now, beshrew my father's ambition. He was thinking of civil wars when he got me. Therefore was I created with a stubbornness outside with an aspect of iron that when I come to woo ladies, I fright them. <laughs> but in faith, Kate, the other I wax, the better I shall appear. And therefore tell me, most fair Catherine, will you have me? Put off your maiden blushes, avouch the thoughts of your heart with the looks of an empress. Take me by the hand and say, Harry of England, I am thine. Which word thou shalt no sooner bless mine ere withal, but I will tell thee aloud, England is thine, Ireland is thine, France is thine, and Harry Plantagenet is thine. Come, your answer is in broken music, for thy voice is music, and thy English broken. Therefore, Queen of all, Catherine, break thy mind to me in broken English. Wilt thou have me? That is as it shall please le roi mon père. Nay, it will please him well, Kate. It shall please him, Kate. Then it shall also content me. Upon that I kiss your hand, and I call you my queen. Laissez, Monseigneur, laissez, laissez. Then I will kiss your lips, Kate. Les dames et demoiselles portent baiser devant leur nom, ce n'est pas la coutume de France. Madam, my interpreter, what, what says she? That it is not be the fashion, for the lady of France. I cannot tell what is baiser in English. To kiss? Your Majesty entends her better que moi. It is not a fashion for the maids in France to kiss before they are married, would she say? Oui, vraiment. <laughs> oh, Kate. Nice customs curtsy to great kings. Dear Kate, you and I cannot be confined within the weak list of a country's fashion. Therefore, Patiently and yielding. You have witchcraft in your lips, Kate. There is more eloquence in the sugar touch of them than in the tongues of the French council. And they should sooner persuade Harry of England than a general petition of monarchs. Ah, here comes your father. God save your majesty. My royal cousin, teach you our princess English? I would have her learn, my fair cousin, how perfectly I love her, and that, that is good English. And you may, some of you, thank love for my blindness, who cannot see many a fair French city for one fair French maid that stands in my way. Yes, my lord, you see them prospectively, the cities turned into a maid, for they are all girdled with maiden walls that war hath never entered. Shall Kate be my wife? So please you. I am content. So the maiden cities you talk of may wait on her. So the maid that stood in their way for my wish 
shall show me the way to my will. We have consented to all terms of reason. Is so, my lords of England? The king hath granted me, granted every article, his daughter first, and then in sequel all, according to their firm proposed natures. And thereupon, give me your daughter. Take her, fair son, and from her blood raise up issue to me, that the contending kingdoms of France and England, whose very shores look pale with envy of each other's happiness, may cease their hatred, and this dear conjunction plant neighborhood and Christian-like accord in their sweet bosoms, that never war advance his bleeding sword twixt England and fair France. Now, welcome, Kate, and bear me witness all that here I kiss her as my sovereign queen. Prepare we for our marriage, on which day my Lord of Burgundy will take your oath, and all the peers for surety of our leagues then shall I swear to Kate and you to me, and may our oaths well kept and prosperous be. Epilogue. Thus far with rough and all unable pen, our bending author hath pursued the story. In little room confining mighty men, mangling by starts the full course of their glory. Small time, but in that small, most greatly lived this star of England. Fortune made his sword, by which the world's best garden he achieved, and of it left his son, imperial lord. Henry VI, an infant and crowned king of France and England, did this king succeed, whose state so many had the managing that they lost France and made his England bleed, which oft our stage hath shown, and for their sake, in your fair minds, let this acceptance take. Thank you so much, everybody. This was such a great show tonight. If you'll give me just one moment, we will hold a curtain call. Uh, here we go. Cast, I have put us into speaker view. Feel free to bring your cameras in and we will uh, run through a curtain call. Please make some sound when we get to your name uh, so that we can actually see you because only the speaker can be seen. Um, I, in some variant of an order, it's not really an order. I'm just gonna run through the names of everybody who was here tonight. <laughs> tonight playing Bedford, we had Joey. Thank you, Joey, for stepping in. Yay, hi. As Gloucester, we had Jake. Thank you, guys. As the messenger and a governor, we have Michelle. Good night, everybody. As Gower and Burgundy, we had Chris. Thank you. As the boy, we had Janie. Janie, make some noise. You got on mute. Thank you. <laughs> As the hostess and Westmoreland, we have Patricia. Thanks, everyone. Don't forget to donate to the center. Tonight as Pistol, you got me. Thank you so much. <laughs> as Nim and Williams, we had Eric. Thank you. Good night, everybody. And the Constable of France. And the con Thank you. I knew I'd miss one. And the Constable of France, Eric. Uh, as yeah, Barrett, that was pretty last minute. <laughs> yeah, we, we had some last minute changes tonight, but we did a fantastic job of working through them. <laughs> yes, we did. All right. I'm going to go now. Good night. Good night. As Bardolph, Orleans, and Erpingham, we had Mark. Thank you, everybody. Good night. As the chorus and the French soldier, we had Kelly. Merci. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. As Canterbury and Catherine, we had Vera. Thank you, everyone. As Fluellen, we had Joe. Thanks for watching, everybody. Good night. As Exeter and McMorris, we had Kevin. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. Donate to the center. Good night. As the Dauphin and Ellie, we had Kurt. Thank you, guys. Thanks for watching. As Alice and Montjoy and Jamie, we had Molly. I would like to apologize to the nations of France and Scotland. <laughs> as King Charles and as Bates, we had Wendy. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone. Donate to the center. And as Henry V tonight, we had Joshua. Hey, guys, that was a blast. Thank you so much.
Thank you all so much. This has been such a fantastic night tonight. Uh, we, Like I said, we had some last minute changes and we had some technical difficulties and this is what makes live theater fun all the time. So uh, before we wrap up tonight, allow me to remind you that many of our actors consider the Center for Performing Arts in Rhinebeck to be our theatrical home in better times. And in this time, we're doing a little bit of rehearsing and they're doing some great live stream productions. So please look into Hindsight and Hope and uh, to someone I love. And those will be running uh, the next few weekends uh, as live stream productions. So you stream them into your house. And then you can join us every day in February for sonnets. Watch for us sonnets at seven every day in February. And we'll be back with shows in March. So from Living Room Shakespeare, good night.